Welcome to Farming for Health, where Farmer Lee Jones and I talk with leaders in food, farming, and health and wellness to spread knowledge and inspire a plant-forward future, starting now. Welcome to the Farming for Health podcast. I'm Dr. Amy Sapola, and today I have the pleasure of being joined by Chef Zane Holmquist. Welcome. Thank you so much for being on today. Thanks for having me, Amy. Nice to see you today. Yeah. So I was hoping we could just start off by learning a little bit about you and having you tell us about your journey to how you got to where you are today. Yeah. Um, well, it's like a lot of chefs. Um, I grew up in a family that cooked a lot. Uh, my family is uh, Swedish on kind of both sides. Um, so we had always had a lot of Scandinavian input into our Americanized meal. So even though we had, you know, like lasagna night, there might be pickled herring and pickled beets to go along with tacos on Tuesday. So it was always a little Scandinavian, you know, bits into uh, my family's food growing up. But my mom was quite an amazing chef uh, and had a number of restaurants and managed a number of restaurants. So like so many uh, chefs, I started out washing dishes at the age of 12. Um, and it was a pretty straightforward deal. If you don't get in trouble, you don't have to come to the restaurant and wash dishes. <laughs> my brother and sister took the easy road and decided to not get into trouble. And uh, I continued to be a, a challenged uh, kid and so I got to start washing dishes with Chef Miguel, and uh, he kept me out of trouble for the most part because he just worked my butt off. So, uh, and so I'm a bit of an old guy. So that was all the way back in the 70s uh, when I started washing dishes. So, 40 some odd years, 43, 44 years later in the kitchen, um, I still wear this. So I've worn basically the same outfit for most of my life uh and most of it's been in the kitchen but that's sort of where it started and i cooked all the way through high school and um you know it wasn't really my thing i'm not a very academic person i struggled with uh, dyslexia um and quite a few other uh challenges in high school so educationally uh it was not my thing um uh you know i just didn't enjoy the classroom structure, you know, it wasn't the happy place for me. Uh, as many students with dyslexia, it, you know, it's very challenging to 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 be in an academic format. Um, so I just kept cooking, and and post high school, I continued, and finally found a, a chef that really um, took me under his wing and and got me in the uh, in an ACF apprenticeship program, uh, working with our local community college and and through our local. Uh, ACF chapter here in Utah and went through that program and, and that kind of really gave me the foundation of of really what a chef was about not just a cook and really the foundations of of the business side the health and nutrition side and, and all the way through and then made the decision to go on to uh, to CIA in New York and um, graduated from uh, CIA in, in Poughkeepsie in 91 and you know, I'd already worked in Manhattan a bit and done that. And then opportunities came, you know, I went to Hawaii for three and a half years and worked there at the Grand Wailea. Uh, it was quite amazing and had the opportunity to come back to, uh, to the mainland and went to Palm Springs and continue my journey with Hyatt. And then some friends here, they still have one of the largest breweries in Utah. They were one of our, they were our first brewery in Utah. Uh, we're doing a big expansion in restaurants. I came back to Utah. Um, uh, my wife was pregnant, so it was a chance to come back and, and opened a really, I think, a cutting edge and ahead of its game uh, brewery. Unfortunately, didn't succeed, and then moved up on the mountain here. You know, I started at a, a hotel, a small hotel, uh, Relaine Chateau, um, the Golden Hirsch, which is right next to where I'm at. I was there for six years, and then I've been over here at Stein Erickson Lodge for. Uh, the last uh, 20, a little over 23 and a half years now. So quite a while. I started out as uh, executive chef and, and moved into now vice president of food and beverage operations and a corporate executive chef. So I oversee 
um, uh, three hotels. We have seven restaurants. Um, I oversee the front of house and back of the house. So all the divisions report to me. Um, and at peak, about 200 team members in my division, 26 million in change in, in revenue through our divisions. Um, and it's quite a special place. You know, Mr. Erickson passed away six years ago, but it was amazing to to uh, be a friend to him and, and spend time with him. He was uh, just an amazing athlete and, and amazing concepts of what he saw hospitality and, and hotels to be. But being part of this team and uh, being part of uh, an amazing program here is, is super special. So I'm, I'm home, I, you know, I grew up in Utah and um, I really, really love what I do. And, and I'm hoping this is um, the retirement position. I hope we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What a journey. And to be the kid that starts off as the dishwasher who's doing it because you got in trouble all the way now to where you're helping to lead an entire, you know, multi restaurant. I still Uh, still wash a lot of dishes. People are surprised sometimes. They're like, where's the chef? I think he's in the dish room. (laughs) So my philosophy is, you know, I never do anything. I never do, or I never ask someone to do something I won't do myself. And I, I, I train all my managers. You lead from the front. If you're not prepared to get dirty, this isn't the place you should be. Um, uh, no one in my division has a job description. We all have a primary, primary duties, but the job description is creating experiences for our guests and helping our teammates. So that's the job description. It's super easy. Um, you know, there's micro ones, whether you're in the pastry shop or a butcher or the sommelier, but, um, that's really it. Roll up your sleeves and get dirty and yeah, we'll get the work done. Yeah. It seems like that would definitely contribute to more of a team atmosphere too because it's everybody's job instead of one and person's and that's sort of the idea you know yeah that's, that's sort of the idea but i don't think you i don't think you ever grow out of the responsibility for helping uh those those folks uh that are on on the on the front lines and, and really in the trenches and mm-hmm. as soon as you walk away from that i think you really stop being a leader and, and you stop you start just becoming sort of a, a figure and uh when i get to that point i'm retiring so hopefully yeah. that never comes. Good. But that's so, that's my professional life. That's what I do. Yeah. So talking about your personal life, I was super intrigued to learn that you're a triathlete. Can you tell us the story of how you got into that and sort of where you're at with uh, athletics these days? A note from our sponsor. Farming for Health is brought to you by Farmer Jones Farm at the Chef's Garden. Farmer Jones Farm provides nutritious, regeneratively grown vegetables to home cooks nationwide. If you are searching for vegetables grown in a way that's healthy for you and good for the planet, try a curated box from Farmer Jones Farm. Get 15% off your order with the code FARMINGFORHEALTH15. Yeah, so... um... About 14 years ago, um, I was at my peak weight. I was always a cyclist. I always rode bicycles and my whole life since a kid. Uh, I've been on bikes. and um, But focus on work and work took over and I wasn't watching my health. And all of a sudden I got to my heaviest at 212 pounds. And my doctor said, you know, we, we have a problem. Um, you're obese and you've got high blood pressure and you've got high cholesterol and you've had a bunch of knee surgeries and injuries and a high stress job. He's like, yeah, you shouldn't bother saving money for your retirement because you're not going to make it. So you can make a life change or life will force you to make a life change. Mm -hmm. And so he was a pretty good doctor. Uh, He was pretty flat, you know, frank and At the time, my wife was doing a little bit of triathlons, and I went to an all, uh, it's called Women of Steel. So I went and volunteered at the Women of Steel and uh, watched my wife race, and I said, wow, I want to do that. And um, I couldn't really run, um, and I could swim. I was used to surfing and being in big water, but I was not a a swimmer. I never swam in high school or college. Um, Then I could ride a bike. So the journey started. You know, it took me about a year until I was comfortable swimming and support from my wife and, you know, lost, uh, you know, 29 pounds and then a bit more. And all of a sudden I'm down 35 pounds and um, cholesterol came around and 
the, the prediabetes corrected itself, but it's still a little hereditary high blood pressure. But unfortunately, I'm stuck with that. And then I started out doing short triathlons, you know, just doing um, kind of the sprint distance. So people call them mini triathlons and then sort of the Olympic distance, which is the next step. And then I finally did a half, uh, a half Ironman. Um, and then in uh, 2007, I did a full Ironman in Napa. And I was sort of hooked. I was sort of hooked from there. Um, and um, just the, the journey and the process. Um, most triathletes tend to be very type A. So being a chef um, came into place. And the process of mise en place, you know, is what we really live and die by as a chef in the kitchen. And that really fits in very well with, I think, health and nutrition and training um, and planning for an Ironman with all of the transitions. So, you know, my mental sense and uh, made it a simple transition. Um, and then six, uh, six and a half years ago, my son passed away and um, really put me into a challenging position mentally, um, uh, some very dark places. Um, you know, when I say dark places, uh, you know, to the point where I, I'm not sure I'll be here tomorrow sort of a dark place and you know athletics and sports and, and uh, the community around triathlon um, uh, kept me going and the sport and activity and putting myself in a position where I was was connected to something and I had a schedule and a plan and races on the calendar and commitment to those um, racing with friends and commitment to help them um, you know, really helped balance uh, my mental health. And I think just the activity, and I found myself doing longer and longer races. Um, I started doing things like uh, the Unbound Gravel uh, Series, which is a 200 mile gravel bike race um, in Emporia, Kansas. Um, and so just doing longer and longer bike races and things that are taking 14, 15, 18, 19 hour uh, events. Um, you know, I think, the, you know, the, the physiology of doing it helps my mental health and then and then the commitment to it. Um, so uh, triathlons really saved my life. I mean, it really physically saved my life. It changed my health, um, but it's also kept my mental health intact and in line and and um, and, and help balance that 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 purpose um, along with work. You know, I, I'm very blessed to have a, a job that's that's it's frantic and busy and lots of team members and lots of things going on and lots of responsibilities. But I think all of those things also have helped support my mental health. Um, uh, you know, um, just keeping my mind engaged and I really go 24 seven is really my, uh, the way I, I go. It's always work and triathlon together. And, and um, so it's, it's, it's it's pretty amazing. And, and, you know, I'm very blessed. I found the place and, you know, so many of my friends, I don't want to make fun of their spouses. Um, but I will, and some are, uh, you know, some, you know, some are same sex spouses and I'm really the, just one of just a few of maybe 25 people I know that I race with that their significant other also races. So it's a challenge for them where traveling to a race and their significant other is, frustrated with it and the cost and the expense and the time and the commitment, you know, when you train 12 or 15 hours a week, it, it takes a lot away from your family, but I'm so blessed to have a wife that, that also trains and races and it, it you know, we do it together. So it, it's even more special uh, and, and, and allows me a lot more flexibility than some because I have that connection with her and that, and that shared interest. And then, you know, at the point, as I said, when she ever get, if she ever gets frustrated with my training or schedule, I just remind her th this whole triathlon thing is your fault. So uh, <laughs> I'm sorry you're stuck with it. You you open the can. Uh, unfortunately, you get to have everything in the can. Um, so that's sort of the the relationship and how I how I got there. And you know, I've really just grown my. You know, I don't have a formal background in nutrition. I spend lots of time. Uh, I've had, I've had uh, diet coaches, I've had athletic coaches, I've spent lots of time with nutritionists, um, and, and a lot of just self-education, um, and trying to sort through 
the craziness of, of diets and food plans and food to support what you're doing. Um, I've had 12 orthopedic surgeries. Um, I get hurt a lot. So, um, you know, I, I broke my hip two years ago and then the second surgery to take the parts out. And I think without that nutrition supporting, you know, supporting my injuries, um, I wouldn't be where I am, you know, I'm, I'm 56, so I'm a mature racer and, um, and that's sort of what I do, but I race a lot. I race the Belgian waffle ride in St. George, Utah on Saturday and, and had uh, a very challenging day with some mechanical issues and a crash and, 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 and finished, but ramping up for half Ironman Washington in three weeks. And I'll do my second full this summer, which is a lot for my schedule to do two full Ironmans. Um, I'll race Ironman uh, Arizona in November. And uh, hopefully that will be my eighth, eighth full Ironman uh, and if, all, if all goes as planned. Um, so that's sort of it. But I race mountain bikes. I race gravel bikes. I race triathlon. Occasionally a, a 5K or sprint. I don't run as much as I used to. So if, occasionally a few, a few running races, but mostly cycling and triathlon. And uh, I'm hoping as, as time goes on and a little more time, I want to do some long swimming events. Um, I'm not fast, but I do love swimming uh, from a person who 12, 13 years ago could barely get across the pool. Um, I can swim, you know, three miles, three and a half miles. Um, and uh, really enjoy, uh, really enjoy the, uh, the rhythm of swimming, you know, mm. it, it's, it's pretty special. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your story. That's an amazing journey. And I think, you know, I'm so sorry about your son and I really appreciate you sharing the mental health struggles too. And that's something I've been talking with other people. I know at Roots, we're going to talk about mental health in the, um, uh, in the industry, but you know, that's something I think is underappreciated. Um, and people aren't always willing to kind of share their struggles, but you know, I think that's so important to talk about, um, and to share. And then also how you've really overcome so much, um, and gone through a lot, um, and found kind of that community. And that's what I kept hearing in your story is, you know, like the racing community, the community, even in your wife, the support um, of being there together. So when you talk about nutrition, can yep. you can we dive a little bit more into that, especially sure. as a chef? I feel like like my vision is that you're eating these like amazing meals, <laughs> you know, like very nutrient dense, incredible meals. Like what is what does nutrition look like to a triathlete chef? Uh, like what sort of what sort well, of tips funny. have you so learned along the way? So I, I have a challenge. I have a sweet tooth. So I very much like sweets. I enjoy ice cream and beer. So yeah. I eliminated ice cream and beer to a big extent. Um, I, you know, I used to have a drinking problem um, as, as a lot of chefs challenge. So that went away. Um, and, and, and part of my journey and part of uh, triathlon and, and being a chef, you know, mm -hmm. uh, being dependent is tough, um, but being a chef with addiction is, is even harder. And it really reduces your ability to really, I think, maximize who you are as a chef and really find, um, find that success and, and bring your talent out when you're suppressing it with, with addiction. So moving past that, you know, I, I track my meals. I, I eat between 19 and 2,300 calories a day. Um, I, you know, it varies as I get close to a race, it changes a little bit. Um, you know, I get a little more lax in the winter time. Um, and, uh, but I try to stay focused. I eat probably, uh, I would say more heavy protein diet. Um, so I eat lots of grilled chicken breast and lots of grilled chicken thighs. Uh, the team here makes fun of me. You know, I'll have like steamed carrots and two chicken thighs with jalapeno jam uh, and three pickles as my lunch so that's sort of a, a, a common one um that i'll that i'll eat at work um, i have a couple of different things i eat here I, I do try to eat in our employee cafeteria every day so when people say they can't eat healthy down there i'm like well we have a salad bar and these things so i do try to build you know a lot of uh, kind of mixed green salads 
with fresh veggies and and then adding protein, quinoa, beans, um, some sort of legumes in there, and then usually some sort of chicken or or we'll have a, a couple of proteins every day. Um, I do have the ability, um, un, unlike a lot of folks, to have like amazingly fresh tuna right from Hawaii flown here. So it's easy for me to have ridiculously fresh pokey. Um, which oh, most nice. people, so I can do things <laughs> that most people can't. Um, so there are a few perks of being a chef and, and being the boss. So there are a few <laughs> things. Um, but, you know, at, at home, my wife is a similar on a similar diet. So she'll get meals started or she'll buy things and I'll finish the meals. Um, and again, you know, we, we use the air fryer and the grill a lot. Um, a lot of simple, clean grilled proteins um, are there. You know, and, and it's kind of simple and even financially, it makes sense. You know, we'll buy a steak, but instead of getting two and usually they're cutting eight or 10 ounce steaks at the store, we'll buy one steak and we cut it in half. So we have four ounces of beef with usually a, a, a quinoa, beans, legumes, a rice, a risotto, and then a salad or veggies. Uh, we do a lot of salad bowl combos where it's you know, some sort of grilled chicken or a piece of grilled salmon with greens and, and veggies, usually something spicy. Um, you know, I, I really try to push a bit of yogurt every day with, with, um, with berries, preferably blueberries and raspberries when I can, and maybe a bit of granola for a uh, bit of granola for some crunchiness. Um, I have a pretty fixed breakfast. I found a protein bar. It's about 280 calories. Um, uh, pretty dense, uh, a peanut butter chocolate protein bar. Um, that's usually my go-to right when I get up. Um, and then I do my workouts and then I always fuel after a workout. So I try to, I try to pick up, you know, a hundred grams of protein, hundred grams of carbs within 15 or 20 minutes of, of a workout and, uh, maybe a bit more if it's a longer, if it's a longer workout. Um, so that's sort of my day. And then along bigger workouts, you know, when I start doing three and four hour bike rides, it's a little more specific with, with what I eat, um, both leading up to races, um, you know, I'll really taper my um, fiber and, and um, beans and legumes and rices and, and veggies. And it'll, it'll become simple starches, a lot of brown rice and, and, and boiled potatoes and, um, and then, you know, really simple, clean proteins, my pre-race, my friends always make fun of me. Um, it's easy if there's a Polynesian restaurant, um, in the town where we're racing and I'll go there and get, um, kind of, uh, uh, chicken thighs with teriyaki and brown rice, or I'll cook that in the hotel or we have a van. So that's my go-to, you know, a, a kind of a, a complex carb with brown rice. Pro, clean protein with grilled chicken thighs, um, a little more fat, but but a little more protein, and then um, a good dose of of teriyaki sauce. I get again a little more carbs with the sugar in that, and then a good blast of sodium. Uh, kind of just that's my my meal right before. I do eat a, a fair bit of eggs for breakfast, and I think eggs settle well on my stomach. So uh, breakfast uh, before will often be like eggs and pan and a pancake or one of my go-tos this Saturday, you know, I got up at four and I had my peanut butter and jelly sandwich is my pre-race, <laughs> uh, my morning race meal. Um, and then when I race, I working with my coach, I try to go um, about 275 to 300 calories an hour um, with between 80 and 90 grams of carbohydrates an hour is sort of what I found you know, fits with my system and allows me to, to maximize my power output and my yield. Um, so that's sort of how I, you know, that's sort of how I manage myself. And I found some products that work. I use um, a product called SIS science and sports. It's a British, uh, British brand that has a gel that's very loose. It's very thin. Um, and they designed it for long distance runners. So you don't have to follow with water like most gels. Um, you can drink it straight uh, and you don't have to back it up with, with liquid. And then there's a, a brand called infinite, um, that, that I, that does custom, um, sports drink mixes for athletes, for athletes. 
So I have two, I have Chef Zane one and Chef Zane two. Um, so I order them from them and, and I can adjust my carbs and protein and potassium and sodium um, and magnesium and then flavor profile uh, to fit what, what I can drink. But, you know, on a, on a big race, um, you know, I can do 12 to 14 gels in a race and, um, you know, I, I, I go with roughly 24 ounces uh, an hour of fluid for me, depending wow. on the race. Yeah. So it kind of, kind of depends a little more if it's hot and humid, a little less, less if it's cooler. So it, it kind of varies, you know, and I know, you know, I know where I need to stand and I, and I put half of my calories in that liquid um so it's hydration and nutrition and that seems to carry and then um you know a few crazy things i get tired of stuff so you know saturday partially through i had some uh teriyaki beef jerky to kind of break up the sweets and then i was really bummed i dropped half of the baggie of that trying to ride on gravel roads and eat is tricky um and and kind of get that down and and then uh, I always have a few uh, red vines in my pocket, um, which are easy to eat. So I'll pull those out and just push in carbohydrates as, as you go. So that's sort of, you know, that's, wow. you know, and, and my splurge is pizza. Um, if I'm going to go off track, I, I, I go pizza. And, you know, I find it's a pretty good balance. You know, you can load it up on some veggies and you've got some dairy and and you can uh, and i'll usually stay away from the pepperoni and go with more like a chicken sausage um and you get some carbs so i find even when i splurge i try to have it make sense um yeah. when when i can and then a balance of of some basic supplements and vitamins to kind of support a middle-aged man who works out a lot you know trying to keep up on things like magnesium and zinc and vitamin d um tend to, you know, burn through those things a whole bunch, um, you know, with training and, and just sweat and depletion kind of up and down. Um, uh, but it's easy, you know, it's easy for me to understand grams of protein in, in food and, and what is food, you know, what has dense uh, um, protein and, and what has quality and what doesn't, you know, and I, I try to explain to people, you know, using things that are are grown with care to me things like chef's garden you tend to get more dense uh density in in protein and nutrition from quality versus less quality and i think that that goes whether you're buying farm-raised fish um or or where you're getting your vegetables from um you know big giant commercially grown carrots i don't, I don't think other than they're crunchy and colorful they, i don't think they pack as much nutrition as people think um yeah. you know we'd like to hope they do and you know and you know so i try to just make you know good choices i eat so much grilled broccoli rob it's insane um <laughs> i i really eat a lot um but i have a wacky food allergy so it, it's weird i can relate to my guests when they come in with food allergies i have a stone fruit allergy oh interesting uh, um the doctor thinks it's the benzene in the in the pits so peaches cherries you know plums nectarines um all of those things um so unfortunately it takes a big swath of vegetable or of fruits out for me um you know um but i try to stay on things too that that help with anti-inflammatory i eat lots of ginger lots of turmeric um lots of curries um I, i'm a big fan of blueberries a uh, big fan, fan fan of um a big fan of celery uh, and celery root um so i try to try to pack in as much as i can that help with with you know uh, anti-inflammatory with my with my injuries you know it's it's a big it's a big push for me um and lots of hydration i try to get close to 100 uh plus ounces a day of, of water or supported water drink yeah. lots of iced tea and, and things and still That's... have a bit of a bit of a soda tooth occasionally um so i try to balance that out and you know i switched over to a, a, a beer called athletic brewing so it's oh, a, yeah i've seen that yeah, so it's a non it's a, it's a zero alcohol um but they actually make it like a beer and then and then centrifuge out the alcohol instead of just making a water flavored beer um so i think you know 
all of those things, getting off of work and sitting down, having a beer, it has all of that, but eliminates that negative impact of, uh, of uh, alcohol. And some balances, you know, there's always a negative and a plus. You hear things like, well, hops, hops have some great anti-inflammatories, but they can also reduce testosterone. So there's, you know, that's where there's such yeah. a mix of information out there for the average person. Like, you know, uh, I have several friends that are kind of avoiding lecterns and, and staying away from some of those things. And they're cutting out, you know, all the nightshades and all the grains. I'm like, you know, I just don't know enough information. They ask me, I'm like, you're getting outside of my skill set. Like, I don't, again, like, you need to talk to a nutritionist, but you know, I, I don't think you should give up all grains. And I, you know, I, I, I'm sort of a, uh, I think everything in moderation and yeah. do everything you love to an extreme. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, to me, you know, moderation is, to me is, is the balance and the key. Um, but it's a pretty simple calorie in calorie out concept too. You know, I mean, it, it, there are some things that can throw people out there, but I think you just, you know, your, your average day, you know, if, if you consume four or 5,000 calories, it's going to be nearly impossible to not put on weight. I mean, even for me, if I'm, you know, if I train for two hours a day and then I push 4,000 calories, I'll still put on weight and, you know, I can have a 15 hour week and put on two pounds. I'm like, how, how did that happen? But it's just sort of, it, it, it sort of creeps up and, and, and it's tough. You know, I love carrots, but you know, they're super packed with calories. Um, you have to really be a little bit mindful too. even something nutritious, nutritious can really, you know, drive up those calories. Other things like berries, you can eat an awful lot of blueberries before you really start to have any calorie count go up, you know, when you're really one or two calories per blueberry. So, you know, you can, you can eat blueberries by the handfuls um, and, and not pack in a whole ton of calories into a, into a snack where like one small cookie is 250 calories it was really delicious. But I kind of put in my mind, like, if you're going to have that cookie, you better offset that with, with something um, and some sort of a workout or some sort of a compromise, you know, later on in your day. So that's sort of my mindset of, of eating and food and nutrition. And um, some of my doctors think I'm nuts and they go, other doctors go, no, it's pretty, you have a pretty good plan. And, you know, it, it, it seems to work. I have a more active day than most between working out and, and working, you know, in the kitchen on my feet. So, you know, I definitely burn calories. Um, but I think it's that it's that balance. And, and, you know, I've always been a big fan of food is, is amazing and it, it, it sustains us, but the act of cooking, um, cooking for yourself and providing yourself that pleasure, um, but cooking for others, I think from a mental health standpoint, you know, cooking for friends, cooking for family, uh, or cooking for guests, and and you know, having that creative set and 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 having your mind focus in that creative mindset, um, I think has, has some amazing mental health um, things to it. But I also just think the rewards of cooking for family and friends and and being engaged with with where our food comes from. You know, it's. Um, my, my team kind of laughed at me the other day. We had the Arkansas um, uh, Farmers uh, Co-op here at the hotel. So there's about 80 some odd farmers and I chatted for them for a minute and I thanked them all. I said, you know, thank you. It's so nice to meet you. Um, I, I, and, and, and they were, my team was kind of like, chef, what's, what's up with the farmer thing? I'm like, I don't understand the question. And they, they were confused. I'm like, I don't have no idea what you're saying. Like, why, why does it seem weird that I, have a connection with the farmers. I'm like, well, technically without farmers and cheese makers and fishermen, um, I don't have a job. <laughs> so, so for, first of all, from a selfish standpoint, they keep me employed. They allow me to have food to feed people, but they are the connection between, you know, food and growing the food and caring for the food and getting it to people. You know, I'm just one step along the way, whether it's, you know, the farmer or the truck driver or the person with the packaging or the delivery driver or the pilots that fly my fish here from Hawaii, you know, everyone has 
you know, it's like a fence and everyone is, is a picket in that fence. And I'm just one along lines getting a meal to people. And hopefully it's a delicious meal. And then hopefully it's has some nutrition uh, baked into that. You know, I try not to put throw nutrition in people's face when I cook, but I still try to make sure our dishes are nutritious. You know, I'm, I'm a luxury property. So people are coming here for a wow meal, this splurged meal. And so I try to deliver some, some nutrition and some balance in that, you know, when I can, you know, and mm-hmm. still creating that experience. So, but I try not to ever put it in people's face. I know we're not, I'm not, it's not my first and foremost to providing a nutritious meal. It's a delicious meal, but then we're going to try very hard to back it up with interesting, creative ways to pack some nutrition in there. And that starts with our farmers and, and our producers, our cheese makers, um, our ranchers, wh- whomever it is, you know, we try to select the very best we can, you know, at, 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 at every point where we touch that food. I love how you bring that up because I think there's so much in like the passion of the people who are growing the food into how that meal comes together and the passion of the chef that creates it, right? But having those beautiful ingredients to work with, I think inherently helps you create a more nutritious meal as well um, because you're working with beautiful whole ingredients that are farmed in a way or raised in a way um, that really optimizes um, the flavor. And along with flavor comes the phytonutrients and the vitamins and minerals and all the things. And so and that's I think, base. you know, it's, it's yeah. hard, you know, it's very hard. And, you know, we're a country of fast food and we, right. we really are. It's just, it, you know, it's the lives we live and we, you know, I mean, fast food brands have become so entwined in, in, in our lives. Um, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be, um and it's great to see you know even commercial grocery stores um doing more limited processed packaged food to allowing mm-hmm. people who have tough schedules to get to get food that's partially prepped and and finish it themselves and and you know i i hope that continues and i and i hope you know i hope that beyond my life that small farmer and family farm and and people who raise animals and produce and food um, for a purpose, not just dollars and cents, you know, the, that passion and, and that care continues on. Uh, it seems like it's an uphill battle in our country. I think we're behind other nations a little bit, you know, not regulating things um, uh, like fertilizers and, and weed killers. I mean, you know, to me, Roundup should just inherently be banned. Uh, you know, GMO, you know, I, I, I actually cycle with the guy who worked for General Mills for years and, uh, you know, GMOs uh, and, and genetically altered grains paid for his kids' college, as he says. So, you know, but he understands from a health, a health standpoint, there are some problems to me. You know, I, I, I think we need to be more mindful about the, the, uh, to have a bit of a pun with what we're talking about, the roots of where we're getting our food. I think right. Americans need to care a little more, not a lot more. You don't have to be obsessive and, and over the top with it. Um, but just like anything in the world, you know, you, you, your voice counts and you, you know, and if you, if you get out and vote, uh, vote and, and share your voice, if you get out and share your, your voice with your farmer's market, with your, with your grocery store, um, with your politicians um, and and support those farmers and cheesemakers and 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 sheep herders and fisher fishermen and you know supporting all those things and and even you know just being mindful about what we put in you know everything goes downstream and what mm-hmm. if you put it down the drain in a stream it's going to end up in in the water where you're getting that fish um, and I think if we could make smaller connections individually you know i think it makes a difference but you you just have to decide that health has a a, a place on your plate not not just sustaining myself and you know we ask the question here we talk a lot about it i think there's two kinds of meals there's utility meals right i'm i I, i've got to eat because i'm going to yoga and then i got to go to work and i got meetings all day and so it's a utility meal i need something right now 
to sustain me and to get my day going. And, and then there's sort of dining and eating for pleasure, right? I'm, I'm going out, I'm creating a meal, we're having friends over, um, you know, there's a family gathering, you know, it, it's a time to connect people and decompress and, and allow the clutter of the day to go away and, and really, you know, find it super exciting to, you know, get some squash from the farmer's market and make a risotto dish and, 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 and sit down and, and enjoy that with family and friends. So there's, to me, there's two kind of meals and, and I think you need to balance each one of those a little bit and, and hopefully you're not having, hopefully every meal is not a utility meal. Like sometimes it is, and there's points in your life where, you know, the beginning of your career, career, or when you have lots of small kids and, and maybe every meal might have to be a utility meal because you're running, you know, 15 hours a day, but hopefully everyone can make time and find a space to have, um, some of those, some of those um, dining experience meals, and and whether you go out or you you create them for yourself, you know, I think they're important to who we are as human beings. You know, and yeah. We, we, when you we started speak, out cooking around a fire in a cave, I mean, yes. You know, when and, you and, speak to experience, especially, I like I think about this a lot, like the dining experience and bringing that home. Do you have like a few tips, like two or three tips for like? How do you elevate that dining experience at home? Um, so there's a couple of things. I, I when I do cooking classes, and I can be like, so I see people having knives in their kitchen and they use them for everything. Their kids like cut rope with them and do craft <laughs> projects. So try to have some knives that are just for cooking, and then it's okay to have you know knives that you know you like cut open a box with and 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 cut wrapping paper with and all those other things i laugh uh, because i identify with the first <laughs> yep so so sort of have some cooking yes. knives um i i think i i think then i tell people don't buy spices in the biggest container get them in the smallest container because you don't use a ton and you don't want them to sit around for too long and i try to tell people if they've been in your cupboard for more than six months go ahead and throw those away so try to keep a, a, a nice selection of spices on hand I think most people at home under spice food and, and when they do they go salt first so maybe moderate the salt and I think there's some quality in salts we can talk about later but yeah I think enhance that with you know with spice whether it's curries or chili powders or turmeric or coriander or lavender or dried herbs um, or combinations of pre-made spices, hopefully not sitting around for a long time, maybe make your own bases. Um, but I think add more spice to your food. Um, yeah. I think th those are those are big things. And then try to cook something that you haven't done before. You know, be bold. If, if you don't have amazing um, Mexican food in your community, cook Mexican food at your house. Uh, if you have amazing Mexican food, in your community, go to those places and try to replicate that at home. Um, you know, we have such a, just an amazing world. Um, try some dishes from Vietnam. Try, um, if you have a smoker, you know, do some smoked uh, dishes. You know, just be bold and, you know, making risotto from scratch and that slow cooking of, of adding the stock and stirring the risotto, uh, it, it's, it's so therapeutic. You know, the same with smoking, you know, getting up at, three o'clock in the morning and putting a brisket on the smoker and letting it cook from three or four in the morning all the way till six o'clock at night um, in the backyard, in the smoker and making your neighbors crazy because it smells so delicious. Uh, and then having friends come over and, and doing a family party or a neighborhood party um, and, and really just opening up that brisket, um, you know, with some amazing fun sides is, I, you know, again, there's so many parts there. It's it's that process of cooking it through the day, selecting the brisket, the putting the spice rub. So I think just putting some time and love into it, be bold, try new things. And I tell people all the time, if worse comes to worse and it's a horrible meal, you can always go to your favorite chef's restaurant and, and still have a great dinner. So um, be bold, try to cook, um, try to make time for it and schedule some time. Um, you know, when I cook at home, I try to do things beforehand. 
So stuff before I leave for work, I'll cut some vegetables up. Some things might be marinated. I'll make a vinaigrette. Um, you know, to me, there's really no reason to buy salad dressings. I mean, in the grocery store, they're so, so easy to make. If you've got a couple of good vinegars at your house, a couple of interesting oils uh, at your house uh, and a good selection of, of spices and, and herbs, it's, it's so easy to make a, a dozen or two different vinaigrettes with, you know, some fresh citrus um, and make one one dressing. It's there for the week or maybe a week and a half. You've made two or three cups and, and you've gone through it and then make something totally different. You know, it's I've got beautiful lavender in my in my front yard. Um, you know, I just made a really simple sweet onion and lavender dressing at the house and it's there and it'll, it'll probably be gone in a day or so. My wife was putting it on, you know, right on the quinoa when it was warm and some grilled chicken and some some carrots and broccoli rob off the grill and and dinner's done. You know, with just the grill and the rice cooker, we didn't heat the house up in the summer, so it's really it's really easy. Recipes are, are so easy to find online, and so many tutelage uh, videos online. Um, you know, there's lots of great uh, lots of great chefs and, and cooks out there. You can find someone you can relate to, um, and it, cooking doesn't have to be hard. There's not a lot of mystery to it. It's not like being a doctor. There's not a you know, a lot of guessing and, and sorting things out like a physician does. It's it's pretty straightforward. You know, we, we clean some produce and some meats and we apply some heat to them and we're there. It, it's, yeah. It's I want to circle back hard. around because I love salt and you mentioned yeah. salt. So let's talk about salt and types of salt um, yeah. and how you use salt. But I think all of those, everything you mentioned, I so agree with, especially the salad dressings too. And we're working with a company right now to do some really neat seasonal vinegars and they're beautiful, but just pairing that flavorful vinegar with a really nice oil, I agree with you. Like if you look at the list of the sa- the ingredients in salad dressing at the store and all the gums and thickeners and everything, it's, it's not very appetizing, right? But if you have a beautiful vinegar and beautiful oil, it's simple and it's delicious and it can be seasonal, which I think is really fun. But let's get to salt. I'm excited to hear your thoughts. A note from our sponsor. The Chef's Garden is a family owned regenerative farm that grows the most flavorful and nutritious vegetables, herbs and microgreens for culinary professionals and home cooks. For over 30 years, the Chef's Garden has supplied some of the world's finest chefs and restaurants. Now, through Farmer Jones Farm, the same delicious ingredients are available to home cooks in the United States to use and enjoy, delivered directly to their homes. The Chef's Garden mission is to grow exceptional vegetables, care for each other and the land, and inspire a vegetable forward future. For more information, visit chefs-garden.com. So salt is, you know, it's a big thing. I, I think where your salt comes from, mm-hmm. obviously, um, I, I've read a few studies lately when, when people are buying like red Himalayan salt or pink Himalayan salt. It is not really coming from the Himalayas. It's coming from China and there's heavy metals in it. So I think you need to think about where your salt comes from. Um, one of my favorites happens to be a Utah product. I often bring it out to our friends in Ohio. It's called Redmond's Real Salt. That's it's what from, I use. <laughs> it's from an ancient seabed. You've got about 50 micro minerals in there. Um, if you taste iodized salt, uh, Morton's, which also is a Utah product, so much of Morton's salt comes from uh, the Great Salt Lake and some of our seabeds here in Utah. But if you take Morton's salt in this hand and, and Redmond's real salt in the other hand and taste them, the equivalent amount, you'll, you'll get more flavor from the Redmond's. Um, so you can actually kind of, reduce the amount of sodium a little bit and, and really still open up that flavor because it has those those parallel minerals to kind of help uh, bring up that flavor. So I, I think salt is great, um, you know, and I think there's a purpose for iodine salt. I think there's something wrong with it. Some people think I can only have kosher salt um, and you could overdo iodine salt, but, um, you know, I think a good clean salt is really important. Having some fun sea salts to finish I mean, it's, it's so easy to season a steak or, or, or a roast, but then when it's finished and you're, you're getting it on the plate, just finishing with a bit of a crunchy sea salt, you know, a, a, a black Hawaiian salt or a, a crunchy sea salt from Mexico um, that 
that just adds that bit of crunch, that bit of salt, just to elevate it and finish it um, is super spectacular. Obviously, there are a few few folks that need to be mindful of, of salt because of some health concerns. But in general, um, you know, most people aren't aren't going to throw themselves over the the limit with salt unless they're eating prepackaged foods. Um, I mean, if you eat like a lot of deli meats and Stouffer's microwavable stuff, um, you're you're gonna probably be at that like. 12,000 milligrams of salt today really, really quick. Like canned green beans, if you look on there, there's just a crazy amount of salt <laughs> in in canned. So I try to tell people, nothing wrong with canned food. I love them, they're great. They're super, super um, sustainable from, from a product standpoint, but frozen tends to have way less yes. sodium. Just in general, we can't all, and I think chefs get really snobby about, you know, it has to be fresh and it's just not, Seasonally, it doesn't make sense. And, and, you know, from time and preparation, you know, it doesn't make sense for every person all of the time. I don't think there's anything wrong with buying frozen vegetables. I think you're getting most of your mineral uh, and, and, and nutrients in there still. Um, we're canning that process is, is kind of bringing a little bit more out. So I think you, you need to balance what you can do for your budget and, and your time and your skill set for your family. So if it's the choice is McDonald's or use frozen vegetables or even can, let's let's go with those versus the drive through. Um, but don't get too stuck on. Well, if I can't get vegetables from the farmer's market, I'm simply not eating them. Well, I would love you to order everything from Chef's Garden like we do, but it's financially and not practical for every person. And and not everywhere has great farmer's markets and they're certainly not. You know, in Napa, they have year round farmers markets, but most of us in this hemisphere have a winter and you, 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 you can't, you, you, you work with what you can. Um, so I think, you know, try to keep things as fresh as possible and, and limit what you do to them. And I'm with you. Like, I like when I buy packaged stuff, like it's rice or it, it's quinoa. It doesn't have a lot in there. Um, uh, and, and when I can't read the stuff, you know, if you're getting like more than one or two things that I can't read on a package, if I can't read it, I'm, I feel comfortable saying I probably shouldn't eat it. Um, just as a, like a super simple rule. I mean, I tell kids that like, if you can't read that, um, eh, you know, maybe one or two are okay. But if you get like six or seven products listed, you have no idea what they are. You can't pronounce them let's maybe just leave that one on the shelf and, and move to something that's a little bit, a little bit cleaner and, and a little bit simpler, you know, and so much of that stuff is just either to, for shelf stability or for, for mouthfeel and, and texture, you know, Americans have this thing about, you know, things have to have a texture to them. And, and so much of those things are, are, you know, lecithins and things that we're adding. It's just for mouthfeel. You know, it has no, you know, no real purpose there other than to give it a, a, a you know, a gravy like texture. I don't know how to, to explain it, but sort of a weird thing. And unfortunately, some people, you know, that's important to them. So I just try to go, you know, less is more. And, you know, and, and again, they're fillers and reducing the price on things. And, and you know, if it's corn chips, just, you know, what, what's in it? Okay. It's, it's got corn and it's, you know, and it's, it's, it's fried in corn oil and some salt. I, I can deal with that. Okay. I mean, you shouldn't probably have an entire bag, but you know, it's pretty simple versus some other chips that have, you know, 50 uh, ingredients in them. And so I think it's just a, a balance and, you know, oils are really hard, you know, a, yeah. I mean, it's hard yeah. to eliminate soy-based oils in your diet it really is complicated um you know no i don't think a huge amount of any oil is good for you whether it's avocado or corn oil or grapeseed oil you know they're all going to have some level of processing you know even olive oils and extra virgin olive oils you know there's a lot of verbiage that trick people in there and really is what it is and organic has you know um you know it's not super tangible anymore just because if you pay enough, you can get, you know, an organic sticker on there. Is it really, um, just, I try to look and see what the ingredients are, the secondary ingredients and, and try to be, 
you know, mindful again, back to that, I think just that balanced diet and, and too much of anything is a problem and try to keep it to a limit, you know, corn oil isn't my favorite, but you know, we fry our French fries in 40% corn oil. They're really delicious. So, <laughs> I mean, you shouldn't have French fries every day, but if you're going to, you know, I think corn oil really makes a great French fry. Um, you know, I think peanut, uh, a, a peanut corn oil blend to me is really ideal. We, I, I don't use peanut oil anymore just because of allergies and, and I, I you know, hidden, you know, hidden things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's tricky, I, you know, just this morning I had a guest asking about, um, about gluten, uh, gluten-free and, and, you know, it's easy for us because we make everything at our hotel. So it sort of is a letdown for some of our gluten friends because they're like, oh, I can eat that. You know, here, you'll see the gluten. It's got a crouton. It's got a cracker. It's on bread. You'll you'll see it. We don't have hidden glutens here. We make all of our sauces. We make all our dressings. Guests ask me questions like, is there gluten in the Caesar dressing? I said, well, no, that would be really weird. Why would I add gluten to it? <laughs> well, they do in the grocery store. I, I understand, but we're not a grocery store. So no, there's no gluten. Are, I appreciate sure? that so much because I'm yeah. someone who has a uh, allergy to gluten and it can be really scary to eat out. And I'm sure, you know, you said you have a greater appreciation for people with allergies. And I think there's a lot of misunderstanding. I had a, um, somebody asked me, well, does milk have gluten? And I was like, oh no, I don't think I can eat. <laughs> like, no. and that, like, that's that's, the question that's that, not good. Is there gluten in your mashed potatoes? Uh, and again, I tell them, well, that'd be really weird. No. Why would yeah. I have gluten in mashed potatoes? You would be surprised the things people are putting flour yeah, in so, or whatever. I mean, you know, yeah. we, you know, we just do things very simple here. Our mashed potatoes, we peel potatoes. We don't buy them peeled. We, we steam them. We put them through a food meal like your grandmother does, even if it's for 500. And then we add some cream and, and milk from our local dairies and some butter from our local dairies and salt and pepper and have a nice day. And I think there's that beautiful simplicity to food made with minimal ingredients, right? You can actually taste the flavor of the food versus having all this People get tricked. You know, people think things like risotto have gluten because of the texture. I'm like, so they they get confused between things that have natural starches and and gluten. It, It sort of, they get, people don't, quite understand what they are and I don't think doctors when someone's when the doctor says well you you seem to have some sensitivity to gluten or sensitivity to dairy they they don't offer the help to explain to them okay how how do I how do I work around this really what it is and it it, is hard to self-educate you know it it is you know it's a time it's timing and there is so much cloudiness when you start getting online um, and not everyone has the opportunity to sit down with somebody who's a nutritionist and discuss it with them. And, and so it is hard to self kind of self educate when you have foodborne illnesses uh, or issues, or you have a health issue and you're trying to eliminate sodium or eliminate these mm-hmm. things from, from your, your diet naturally. It, it's, you know, it's really tough and, and people don't understand, you know, things like spinach and celery have a ton of salt, you know, sodium naturally in them. And then you add a salty dressing to that. You, yeah, you could easily put yourself over your maximum sodium for the day, but everything was nutritious and you made it from scratch and, but it just is there. So I think it's just some self-education and yeah. but it's hard. So, you know, and again, I'm not a nutritionist. We don't sell that in our restaurant here, but I do try to pack in whenever possible as, you know, as much, you know, nuts and, uh, and, and, and different things to add texture and flavor and excitement to the dish, but they're adding to those layers of blueberries and arugula and extra virgin olive oil and walnuts and, and pecans and pine nuts, um, and, you know, and, and sustainably raised, you know, proteins and small farm vegetables you know we try to add all of those pieces into a meal um and that becomes more than just nutrients right it's like nourishment at that point like and that's what i like people to think about is 
how do you actually nourish your body? And that sort of meal is like, oh my gosh, that is really nourishing. And I think it's nourishing even just for your senses, right? Not just like taste-wise, but like looking at it, smelling it, you know, feeling it, seeing it, all all the things. things. All those things have to make it exciting. I mean, and food should be fun. Like, yeah, I love I, that you said the like the pleasure and the joy of eating. Yeah, right? I mean, there's nothing like when I go to New York, I always have a hot dog off the street, and I always get a, a, a slice or two of pizza in the city. Um, it's just part of being in the city and the atmosphere and the experience. Um, you know, I'll try to pick somewhere that's doing you know, uh, a Nathan's hot dog and, you know, a, a, a small, a, a small pizza shop that I know is making their dough fresh. And, but again, there's still those, there's those things that are part of a trip or an experience or a place that you just, you, you know, you should have an experience. that's part of, part of life. I don't think you should give up everything. Um, I, you know, I don't think nutrition should be the only guiding uh, point in someone's meal plan. You know, it, it has to sustain you. It has to have uh, the nutrients to get you through the day. And, and, but it also has to energize who you are as, as a person and connect you to the other people in your lives. Back to what we said, you know, as, as a species sitting around a fire, cooking a hunk of meat uh, in a cave, you know, that was sort of a, a, a thing. And, you know, that's sort of who we are as humans. You know, we love you know, we love standing around a grill and, and, and sitting around a table and, 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 and having that food there. And so many cultures are, you know, I love going to a Korean restaurant and, and having a hot pot and, you know, I, I family style is great fun, you know? And, yeah. You know, I think that's a beautiful transition because my next question to kind of wrap up is our podcast is called Farming for Health. What does Farming for Health mean to you? And I think we've talked a lot about it, but we have, you know, I, yeah. I think, I think it's, I think it's people who are farming and, and, and let's not kid ourselves. Every farmer, no matter, unless you're a backyard growing uh, farmer, but every farmer still has a financial, uh, you know, they have a fiduciary responsibility to their family, to their banks. So let's not kid ourselves. There's no farmer that grows just f- for fun, but someone who grows and produces food, for other reasons than just their job. They're growing it because they care about that skill. They care about history. I find most farmers attached to history in some sense. They're attached to the equipment that their grandfathers used and vintage equipment and, and how their grandparents raised, uh, raised that product um, or how we did it 300 years ago or 500 years ago or 800 years ago or even a thousand years ago, right? Um, I think we're, we're attached to that, but someone who's growing and producing food for other than just money, they're, they're producing food for flavor. They're producing food for nutrition. They're producing food to add flavor to enhance people's lives and create and create experience for them. And I think it's people who do it with passion and do it with love. And whether you're an oyster farmer or a mussel farmer or a lobster, uh, lobster fisherman, um, or a vegetable grower, or, you know, you have a hundred goats, whatever it is doing with passion and, and, and doing it mindfully, um, thinking about the people next to you and, and the chemicals and the process you're using and, and how those things touch that food that you're then passing on, uh, to the, to the public and the people who are buying your product. And so, it, you know, I, I think it's just a mindfulness um, about what they're doing. And, and I think it's just the love, you know, you, mm-hmm. you know, when I meet people who just love what they do and, and whether that's cooking the food, but anywhere along that, that process and line of, of going from where the food started from to getting to the guest, whether it's the server in the restaurant, you know, knowing what has gluten and, and what doesn't. You know, having that ability to help a guest with with nutrition questions or food allergy questions, all the way back to that farmer who knows what chemicals he's using, um, but what his neighbors are using, and and how is that that that's carrying over. So I think it's everyone in that process to get the food to our plate, if they do it uh, with some care and some knowledge um, and some passion, you, you end up with 
incredible food. It's going to taste better. It, 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 it's going to bring that sense of life and that sense of the, the, the product to us. And I think we own it as chefs. You know, it, it kills me when, when we waste food or, um, you know, when, when, when it, it just doesn't work out, you know, our, it's that person's love goes into it to see a piece of fish or oysters go bad because we didn't use them. Um, you know, I think we're, we're really doing a disservice to those people who, who, who cared and, and raised that product. Um, you know, so I, I think it's, it, it goes forward and backwards. And I think it's, you know, I think consumers need to thank farmers a little bit more. And, and, you know, it, it upsets me. I've had maybe slightly too aggressive conversations with people at farmers markets when they complain about the price of things. It, it, it's sort of like, I sort of get this glazed look. I'm like, what did you just say? I'm like, like that is the rudest thing you could ever say to a farmer. I can't believe you're charging me eight dollars a pound for that. I'm like, do you know what it takes to produce this? Like that is that is so rude to say that to that person. Um, like it, it it hurts me personally. I'm like, it's still a bargain. This person is not driving a luxury SUV on the back of your produce. They're getting by and they're raising their family, but. They, they still have a cost to create this and, and get this to you. And yeah, I think that's the, 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 the biggest insult you could ever say to a, a cheesemaker, a farmer or a producer. I can't believe you're charging me that much for this. Um, I think that's, that's lack of education. I, I think most people don't mean anything by it, but it's still, they just don't have that understanding education of how backbreaking it is to produce food um in in a sustainable caring way you know mass produced soybeans isn't overly backbreaking you know machines do it all and we spray a bunch of stuff on it and you know uh five hundred thousand dollar machines process it and turn it into weird stuff and we use it but really hand hand raised cared for farm to table small farm um yeah uh, but that's the other thing I close with one tirade on farm to table it makes me batty when people say that, are you a farm to table restaurant? I'm like, I've done this for 45 years and I've always bought food from a farm that went to your table. I'm not sure there was a point in history, like maybe when we get to like Star Trek time and like food just comes out of a little synthesized thing, but you know, all of our food we buy comes from a farm some comes from mass produced farm as I have to buy that. Some comes from small family farms. I, I can't get everything from a small family farm, but yes, all, all restaurants, all chefs buy food from a farm and it comes to the restaurant and goes to your table. So farm to table is sort of a weird thing. It confuses chefs. We're like, what? what? Um, yes. Now there are quality of farms. If that's what your question is, you know, uh, and one of the things I try to do is I try to know the name of the people I get stuff from. The, the, the folks I buy fish from, I know their names. The person who, who I get my spices and, and dried herbs from, I, I know his company. I know Jake. So I, I, whenever I can, I try to know the names of people I'm getting stuff from. And, and to me, if I get to the point where I know them and I know their name, there's a connection there. Um, you know, I, I I use thousands of pounds of Yukon gold potatoes a month. I don't know every farmer who grows those in Idaho. Um, and then my other philosophy is I try to get the best product I can as close to the restaurant as I can. Some people think just because they got something locally, it's the best product, which isn't always the case. You know, there's some areas that you can't produce the best of something because of that climate um, or that person doesn't have the skill set or the passion or the size or the volume. Um, so just people get confused. They think just because something was raised close to them that it's the best, which is sort of ridiculous, right? Like you wouldn't say, well, that art was made close to me. The artist lives down the street from me. It's the best art ever, right? You, you wouldn't say that, but we say that about food. So people assume just, just because that food at the farmer's market is just a few miles away, it, it, it's going to be the most wholesome or the most flavorful or have the, the most, the, the most nutrients in it. Not always the case, you know, here in Utah, I have amazing lamb, amazing Buffalo, amazing elk, 
but our local beef isn't fantastic. So I get a little farther away, I go to Idaho um, uh, to get a, a lot of our beef. So it, it's, you know, some of this misnomer that people think because it's close, it's the best. I think that's a really great point and something that even myself, when you say that, I'm like, yeah, that actually, that makes a ton of sense. So to close it out today, I know our listeners are going to want to connect with you, find out more about the restaurants. Um, where can they find you online? So um, I don't do a lot. I don't do, I don't do Facebook and stuff. You can find me on Instagram. Uh, it's uh, uh, Chef Zane, um, uh, uh, Chef Zane Homequist on Instagram. Um, you can always send me an email um, at, at zhomequist at steinlodge.com. Um, if it's complicated, put in a phone number, I'll call you. Uh, um, you can go to our uh, steinlodge.com uh, website, Stein Erickson Lodge, um, and look at our website. We have a, a pretty good landing page um, that, that shows off all of our, all of our restaurants. Um, about half of my online content is athletics and sport. Half is kind of food. So it's sort of a mixed bag of what you're what you're looking for. But I, I, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy ge- engaging with people and, and helping people um, equally with their career. You know, teaching is 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 important as cooking. You know, I, I tell my young chefs, if you can't teach, you, you can't be a chef. Um, it's, it's what we do we, and we have to teach. And hopefully we're teaching um, more than just the cooking skill. We're teaching life skills and mental health skills and sustainability skills and teaching our young chefs about nutrition and farmers and relationships. Um, it makes me crazy when my chefs want to text an order in. I'm like, well, why don't you call the fish guy and talk to him instead of send him a text? So we have a, a relationship and a connection. Um, you know, it, it, it's important. So, but you can reach me in, 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 in lots of different ways. And I'm always happy to talk to folks about food and, and, and help you if you have questions or, if you're interested in a career in cooking or um, yeah, I, I often recruit at, at the Culinary Institute in Hyde Park and um, we try to visit the farm as much as possible. So we, we love what we do and, you know, that's what makes makes it special. You know, I have uh, yeah, a connection with food and people and, and it's super fun to teach and cook and, and yeah, it's a crazy oh. world being a chef. Yeah, you are a wealth of information. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. And I can tell you're an amazing teacher just by how easily you're able to share all of this. So thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you for listening to Farming for Health. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Connect with Farmer Lee Jones and I on Instagram and Facebook.